Hello and welcome to Backyard Reactors, a program about the failed nuclear power plant project here in Midland. My name is Ron Beacom. My guest is Lee Smith, the author of a book with the working title, Backyard Reactors. Lee is retired but had a career in the energy industry. The material in this program comes from research for the book he's been writing about the nuclear power plant. On the personal side, Lee lives here in Midland with his wife, H.J. Smith. So, Lee, welcome to MCTV. Thank you. I asked Lee to do this program after seeing a short presentation he made to the Midland Rotary Club early last summer. He then gave a full presentation at the Doan History Museum in August. So, Lee, let's first talk about your background in the energy, energy industry. What was your job here in Midland before you retired? I came to Midland in 1988 to take a job managing the natural gas supply to a whole new uh, facility that had been constructed utilizing some of the material that had been put on the site for the nuclear plant. Uh, as I worked there to 2004. I left when I left there. I was in charge of all the natural gas arrangements for that plant and, and also in charge of short-term electric sales that we made at MCB. So what you do with your, what was the point of your, uh, the goal of your consulting business after uh, you retired? And then I really didn't want to retire, so I went into consulting and basically what I did was work with uh, companies and utilities, helping them manage uh, electric sales and purchases and purchases of large quantities of natural gas. And let's go way back in your background. Where'd you go to school? What'd you study? Okay, in the beginning, I uh, <laughs> went to Michigan State, got a bachelor's degree in geology, went in the Navy, and they made me an engineering officer on a landing ship tank. Went back to Michigan State, got a uh, master's degree in geology, and then started working in New Orleans for Texaco as an offshore geologist. But as my career developed, I went from the technical side to the business side and got into the area of uh, managing natural gas supplies to industrial customers and helping them evaluate the reserves that they're relying on for those natural gas supplies. And Lee, I'm not asking for a long answer on this, but for most of us, our, our contact with energy is the gas we put in our car, the thermostat on the wall, that's just about it. Most of us, the average person, doesn't know the layered, intricate system that's involved to deliver energy for our day-to-day -day use, do we? No, that's true. Uh, just to, to start from the very beginning, a well uh, generally produces natural gas, a very simple molecule, methane CH4, and then produces a whole bunch of other molecules that uh, go into gasoline, diesel fuel, and a whole bunch of other products. So uh, there is a and of course with natural gas is a wonderful fuel to generate electricity with. So a lot going on. So why write a book about the nuclear power plant project here in Midland? Well when I came here in 88 it was great because if it had been a nuke plant I wouldn't have had a job here. Uh, but I always wondered how it was that you could take three really big companies who were involved in it and spend 4.1 billion, which is now 13 billion in today's dollars, and not finish it as a nuke plant. So that always gnawed at me over the years. So that's kind of what drove me to start to look at this. Well, let's start taking a look at your slides. Okay. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, first of all, we got to talk about when, where, what, and why, as you usually do when you talk about something. And a night, this all started in 1967, and everything seemed great in America. Unemployment was below 4%. Wages were growing at over 5%. Most Americans believed President Johnson's story that we were fighting a war in Vietnam to keep the world safe from communism and that we were winning. And Michigan companies were building cars that people bought. Uh, things were great in the auto industry and work was underway to provide electrical supply from clean nuke plants instead of dirty old coal plants. Uh, in Midland, things were going good. The Dow Chemical Company, which if you looked at the banner, the Midland Daily News called itself the world's greatest chemical center. Uh, in 1967, the Dow Chemical Company uh, had for the third year a billion dollars in sales. They increased their uh, cash dividend from 50 to 55 cents the third time in four years. And their research was going great guns. And they started out the first 
nuclear reactor in Midland. Very small research reactor, but from what I can discover from my research, they did what they need to do as far as regulations. They built it to specs and they started it up and everything seemed great with that. There was no community opposition to this reactor even though it was situated in the Dow Chemical Complex close to schools and churches and where a lot of people lived. Uh, in December 14, 1967, Consumers Power announced that they would build two very large nuclear reactors in uh, Midland and although the headline in Midland Daily News said it was for Dow's power use, it was. The plant was to supply all the steam that the Dow complex needed, but it, these reactors would also supply enough electricity for a million uh, households. So this was a big plant. Uh, where it was located, uh, although it's right on the edge of Midland, it's very difficult to see. A lot of you, even if you've lived in Midland a long time, probably don't know where this plant is. One place you can see it is if you go to Whiting Overlook Park, uh, this is the Midland, what, the, what was originally the Midland nuclear plant. Uh, you, can, you can see it from that vantage point, but really there are few other places in Midland where you can see it. Uh, it's on a 1,200 acre site, uh, adjacent to is an 880 acre cooling pond. Uh, there are also some Dow ponds adjacent to this site. Uh, if we look for a minute at the major uh, buildings in this site, up in the upper left-hand side, you'll see uh, what are called containment buildings. They're large concrete silos that house uh, the nuclear reactors and the steam supply system. The, the next building in the middle of this picture is a steam turbine building. The steam that comes from these reactors comes over into this building and uh, spins turbines that spin generators. And the third big building here is the emergency generator building. Uh, a nuke plant like this has to have a way to supply electricity if there would be some major problem to run pumps to cool down the reactors. So that emergency generator building is a critical piece of a nuke plant. Uh, again, this was to generate enough electricity for a million homes and it had the ability to supply 25% more steam than Dow needed in 1967 and it's difficult to denominate quantities of steam. It's, it's four million pounds an hour of steam but another way to look at it, it was enough steam to supply, to heat all 800 buildings that were in the Dow complex at that time and then again enough uh, steam to produce the calcium chloride uh, which is kind of equal to the Dow uh, space heating needs. So, so a lot of steam in okay. short. All right. uh, we need to talk just a second about what a nuclear plant is. You, we saw those big concrete silos a minute ago. That's a, called a containment building and in there there's a reactor. Uh, the, the nuclear reaction produces a lot of heat. Uh, that heat goes through a item called a uh, steam uh, generator where there's a transfer of heat from that uh, that makes steam that goes to con conventional steam use. Uh, a conventional coal-fired plant just makes steam with coal, but this the steam comes from the nuclear reaction. It spins a turbine. It was also going to go into a heat, another heat exchanger, and that would produce the process steam for Dow. One of the reactors in the design would have this ability for steam for Dow. The second one was just going to be straight electrical generation, although if you look at the schematics for it, there was a way they could cross connect the steam from these two reactors. But that's just very, very quick, simple description of what was here. One, the containment vessels with the reactors in it. Two, you might say a conventional steam plant. Okay. Uh, and when this was announced, the cost was supposed to be 267 million. That's a number that I'll ask you to keep in your head as we proceed through the history of this. Uh, it was supposed to be completed in 1974 to provide steam to Dow. 
and we'll talk in a minute about why Dow needed that steam. And the cost of electricity, although you probably all remember that atomic energy was supposed to produce electricity for costs too cheap to meter. Well, that never was exactly true. But consumers said that this plant would produce electricity at 0.4 cents for kilowatt hour. To put that in context, uh, if you present value that to give a crude idea what this, if this plant would have worked as, supposed, as it was supposed to have, you'd have been getting how, uh, like this to cost of electricity for your house would be three cents for a kilowatt hour. If you've looked at your bill from consumers lately, you're paying about 9.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So crudely speaking, this plant, the original promise was you'd have been paying a, only a third of what you pay for electricity today. And again, that's with adjustment to today's dollars. Yeah, I, I've tried to adjust it to today's prices. Okay. Uh, in 1967, uh, Dow and consumers signed the contract that were, wherein Dow was going to receive this steam. Uh, it was a uh, game-changing thing for Dow to do that, uh, to understand kind of the Dow situation. We just go back in history a bit. Uh, when Herbert Henry Dow came to Midland in uh, 1890, there were two things that were important to him here. One was, of course, the brine in the ground where he could use his process that he's just delivered, developed to produce bromine. But the other thing was there was cheap energy available from lumber uh, waste. Well, Dow had a somewhat of a falling out in 1893 and left Midland briefly and went off and developed a process where he could produce chlorine from uh, Brine through electrolysis project. He came back here in 1895, 1896 uh, to found, to use that process to produce bleach. And one of the things he used in his promotion to get the Dow Chemical Company started was the fact that there was inexpensive coal available from coal mines that were just being uh, developed in the area. In other words, it was cheap energy again that was one of the foundations of the Dow Chemical Company being in Midland. And a quick sidebar, yeah. so coal was mined in this area? It was. There was a, a good deal of coal mined in Bay County, in Saginaw County. Uh, there are uh, mines pretty close to here and he was going to be able to get coal from those for 70 uh, cents a ton and he was going to need a bunch of tons every day to run the beginning Dow Chemical Company. But if you fast forward from the 1890s to 1967, the local coal was long gone. It really peaked in the uh, very early uh, years of the 1900s. Uh, the weight lumber waste was long gone. And Dow was having to rely on uh, coal being uh, arriving by train every three days from southern Ohio. It was expensive and it was incredibly dirty. Uh, one person told me that uh, a man who lived adjacent to Dow Chemical Company, the reason he had so many kids is that damn train arrived every morning at five o'clock and woke him up. Uh, I don't know that that's true, but it, it was, there was a lot of coal coming into Midland to run the Dow Chemical Company operation. Um, so, uh, and on another path, Dow had started their operations in Texas where their uh, energy costs were much less than they were in Midland. So although in Midland there were several hundred million dollars of plant investment, there was a basic fundamental problem that Dow had at this time as to what were they going to do for energy. So uh, the idea of having consumers be able to supply this steam at less than the coal cost was extremely attractive to them. And another quick sidebar, Lee. I mean, back then, today, it's always a challenge for any manufacturing operation or any company that, you know, the cost of energy and where to get it, and all those types of things. That's a pr problem that's been going on for a long time. It is, and as some Dow people said it, uh, at this time that, that energy was actually part of their product and what they were trying to express is when you're producing commodity chemicals uh, it is 
essential that you ha that you have the cheapest energy you can have to be able to compete in that business. Okay. Uh, consumers' motivation. Uh, was was very different from Dow's motivation as to why they wanted to get into this, uh, to build this plant in Midland. Uh, consumers in 1967, uh, the previous 10 years, their their demand had been growing, their sales of electricity had been growing at 10% a year. They did studies in 67 that indicated they would need to double their generation capacity by 1975. Uh, Consumers is a company that started in the 1880s with using dams to generate electricity through mergers, acquisitions, building new dams. They grew their generation capacity. Uh, by 1940, they were out of dam sites in Midland, or in Michigan rather, and so they went to coal plants. But by the 1960s, they obviously needed to do a lot more generation. And Jim Campbell, was strong to build nukes. He thought that that was the direction the company needed to go in. And again, Jim Campbell was? Is the president of, of consumer. Consumers Power. Okay. And, and he felt that was absolutely necessary that they get into nukes. Even though Consumers Power was a mom and pop company, reliable dividends, conservative utility, making a jump to brand new nuclear energy was a jump. But Jim Campbell was convinced the company needed to do that. And so they started with a little plant over on Lake Michigan near Charlevoix, Big Rock Point. Uh, then in 1966, uh, they uh, announced they would build a Palisades plant on Lake Michigan down south of Charlevoix. And the next announcement was the Midland plant. Not only was Jim Campbell strong on consumers building new plants, he had some very decided ideas on how to do it. For one, although the first nuke plants that were built by utilities in this country were built on a turnkey basis, in other words, a fixed cost, the, the utility agreed to pay a cost and it was delivered at that cost. Uh, Jim Campbell didn't think that consumers, he thought consumers knew how to do it, so they didn't need a fixed cost contract. They could do it on a cost plus contract. Secondly, he thought consumers had the ability to choose the manufacturers for equipment. So for their Palisades plant, for example, they chose combustion engineering and the first nuke system that combustion engineering had ever built, which proved very shortly to have been a mistake because it didn't run very well. Uh, for Midland, they chose uh, uh, another company who and the ninth and tenth reactor that this company had ever built. And uh, although they couldn't have known it at the time, one of the other of these first ten reactors went into the Three Mile Island plant, and we'll talk to, about that a little bit later. The, the last thing that Jim Campbell thought is that although consumers didn't have the number, necessary total staffing to build plants, he thought you could just contract for somebody to oversee construction of the plant. And for that, he chose the Bechtel Corporation. Uh, Bechtel had completed a one-year study prior to the announcement of the Midland plant that said that it would work for Dow and consumers. And, uh, and then they hired, uh, consumers hired him on a cost plus contract to be the architect engineer contract for Mid the Midland plant. The Bechtel Corporation was a very big, very sophisticated worldwide corporation. Uh, they were had started with the construction of the, being one of the companies in the Hoover Dam originally. They'd gone in World War II, they built ships, then they built big pipelines, the BART system. So they were a very well uh, known construction company. So as you, as you look at this thing, in 1967, you have Consumers Power, who was the 10th largest combined utility in the country at that time. You had Dow Chemical Company, who was supporting it and contracting from it. And they were, depending on how you measured, that this, the second or the th uh, third largest chemical company in America. And you had the Bechtel Corporation, a worldwide 
construction company. So, you know, what could possibly go wrong with this system? <laughs> well, it turns out there was this woman, Mrs. William D. Sinclair of 5711 Somerset Drive. Now, I, I label her on this slide because when you first read about her in the late 60s and the 70s, she was always referred, her, her street address was always given. It would seem that at this time people expected that they needed a street address where they could find her baking cookies in the kitchen or something. <laughs> but Mary Sinclair was not that kind of woman. And uh, a very short bio of her would be that she was born on the Iron Range in northern Minnesota. Uh, she graduated first in her high school class. She went off to college at St. Catharines College in St. Paul, Minnesota. She majored in chemistry and in English. She then was a uh, editor, proofreader, and so forth for technical uh, publications. And in the period 1948 to 1951, when her husband was at, in law school at Georgetown, she had a job at the Library of Congress. And what she did there was she improved the grammar and writing of scientists who were writing about nuclear energy. And it was at that time that she noticed, it, anyway in her opinion, that these articles always downplayed the risk of nuclear energy. And so that left a real big impression on her. And after she came back, they, she and her husband came back to Midland, uh, she continued to read on her own about nuclear energy. But if, if we come to 1967, you could describe Mary Sinclair as mother of five children, wife of a very successful attorney in Midland, member of Blessed Sacrament Catholic Church, member of the family board uh, in, in Midland. In other words, your good housewife of 1967. Her public, uh, as, as well as I could, could find her public uh, activity. Uh, she had been awarded a uh, award by the PTA for some articles she had written on education in Michigan, and she'd also been very instrumental in working out a system where people with mental health problems didn't end up in asylums and jails uh, immediately, so that they would have some help. So that was, that was, you might say, January 1967. By the, you know, well, well, I would just add a comment that, uh, you know, research nowadays is done so much easily, so much more easily online. Yeah. And you th figure a person back then, the work it took to do research. Yeah. Because the materials just weren't easily accessible. Exactly. You had to go find them and get yeah. them. So credit yeah. to anybody, but yeah. especially to Mary at that time. That's right. And. Uh, uh, so, she, it, so I've kind of painted this picture up to, six, you know, her background up to 67 and, and the beginning of 1967. By the end of 1968 or early 1969, she was job killer, enemy of the Dow Chemical Company, uh, persona non grata in Midland. People refused to look at her or talk to her when she went to the Midland Symphony or went shopping. Her children were insulted in school by other students and teachers. Her daughter told her years later that she would go to the restroom so that people wouldn't see her cry. People threw garbage in her lawn. She felt her telephone was tapped. All this change happened because she started raising questions about the safety of the Midland plant being plopped down right in the city of Midland. Uh, and she uh, wrote articles, she uh, appeared, uh, spoke to groups, she raised money to publish a pamphlet uh, about the dangers of nuclear energy. She formed a group in 1970 uh, called the Saginaw Valley Study Club. I don't have that name exactly right. But that group was one that uh, shortly thereafter, when they were going to have construction hearings, 
construction permit hearings to allow the plant to be constructed, uh, she went out and found a very good lawyer to hire to intervene in those hearings. So she was successful, I guess you would say, in a whole number of areas, raising money, organizing, speaking, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's what got her the, the, you might almost say hatred of the people in Midland. I've used that term before when I've interviewed people and in speeches and they say that that's too strong, but I really can't, it's really difficult to find, a, you could say shunning, you could say a lot of things, mm -hmm. but that's the kind of, that's what happened to her. And uh, although through this whole period of time, and it goes on for some period of time, uh, the executives change, the lawyers change, and so forth. But Mary Sinclair was there at the beginning, and she was there through the whole process of this uh, plant. Uh, and, and there was a reaction to Mary Sinclair. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce formed an, an organization called the Midland Nuclear Power Committee. Uh, it was headed by Dr. Reverend Dr. Wayne North. He was called doctor because he had an honorary uh, PhD. Uh, he uh, had in 1969 attended a two-week uh, nuclear energy for a clergyman at uh, Oak Ridge. It was a uh, thing put, uh, sponsored, funded by the Atomic Energy Commission that had the dual uh, responsibility of both regulating and promoting uh, nuclear energy. You don't want to think about that too much. But at any rate, Dr. North was very strong in his beliefs, whether from this two-week conference or for whatever, that the, new, that the plant in Midland needed to be built. Uh, and he said that a lot of things, but one of the things he said, the chances for a major nuclear accident are in the order of a billion to one. So he was a strong advocate for that. Uh, the committee he headed did uh, uh, brought some people up to do ed educational things. They spoke to groups, but their big, their big thing that they did was the Speak Up Now rally on October 12, 1971. Uh, $32,000 was raised for this rally. It was no minor deal. Kids got uh, afternoon excused from school. The bands of both high schools were there to play. Uh, they brought in people from uh, outside to talk to this group, uh, and 15,000 people showed up at the fairgrounds on the north edge of Midland to go to this. And just to give you a little flavor of what that was like, the, they brought in a man called Art Linkletter, who was a star, longtime star, radio and TV, well known for writing a book, the Kids Say the Darndest Things. So they, Art Linkletter arrived by helicopter to give a speech. And this is what he had to say. Uh, well, wait a minute, one more slide. Uh, just, this is just kind of the warm up. They had a, the breadfruit band with a bunch of uh, high school kids doing the warm up and then the rest happened. I forgot about this slide here, but at any rate. So at any rate, this is what he had to say. And if we were going to run a little video clip now. Midland's children were let out of school. Dow employees were allowed off work to hear featured speaker Art Linkletter tell them anyone who was not for the plant was out of touch. If the environmental people who are so picky about the possibility of some little thing being disturbed want to live by candle power and toast their bread over campfires, then they're welcome to it, but the rest of us have got to go on living in the manner which we're accustomed to. And the reason that we had that, that uh, extravaganza that we did was nothing more than to tell the world that Midland, Michigan wanted that plant. In Washington, their message was heard. A construction permit was granted in 1972 to Consumers Power Company and its builder, the Bechtel Corporation. It seemed that Midland would get its nuclear plant after all. And Alan Ott, who runs a bank in town, 
was among those in Midland to believe that the licensing hearing proved Mary Sinclair wrong. Nobody in this community wants an unsafe plant. No, no one's ever proposed that. Yeah. And uh, Mary's items about safety, I think she has provided a service. But you, you operate within the system and you have licensing procedures and you have all the, uh, supposedly all the safety checks to build a safe plant, uh, you have to assume those things are correct. Midland's children were let out of school. Dow employees were allowed off work. Expecting that after the uh, construction permit was granted, and by the way, it didn't happen right after uh, this rally. It went on for a while, and, didn't, and they didn't get this construction permit until December of 1972, which, of course, threw their whole schedule off that they had originally. But, but Alan Out was right that, you know, if you were a Midlander, you would have expected things would just proceed, and maybe there'd be a little cost overrun, and it would get done. Well, that's not what happened. Uh, the cost estimate that had originally been 267 million uh, by 1978 was 1.6 billion. And why was this? Well, uh, there were a number of reasons. Uh, probably the original estimate had been based on turnkey project costs, fixed cost contracts that hadn't happened. Uh, consumers' power had stopped engineering work when they were doing the, the permit hearing. Consumers Power actually ran out of money and had to curtail construction at Midland in 1974 because they had so much else going on. Uh, inflation, um, during the Vietnam War, inflation kicked up, so it's costing consumers a lot more to borrow money than they thought about. And their workforce, which they'd originally said it was going to be 500 to 700, had ballooned by 1978 to 3,000 employees on the site. So there are a number of reasons that the cost got going and another problem was they had quality control problems they had a cement pad problem in 1970 and they had a welding problem in 1974. Uh, the result of these uh, early quality control problems was that the enforcement people said that consumers just wasn't paying enough attention to what Bechtel was doing on the site. Uh, that uh, brings us to a major uh, cons quality control problem uh, that started in night discovered in 1978 where the diesel generator building the building circled here was discovered to be sinking uh, it turned out that the area circled here where where the most all the buildings were in order to build it on the floodplain, they added 35 feet of fill dirt, but they failed to compact that fill dirt. So, although the containment vessels, those big concrete silos, had been dug into the ground the way they should have been, a whole bunch of other structures were just put on top of this 35 feet of fill dirt. Uh, as a result, uh, they had the sinking of the of the, uh, these, the emergency generator building, but more seriously, the area between the containment vessels and the big steam turbine building had a problem. In order to fix this, and I don't know if it's that clear on this slide, the area that's in yellow here, they had to dig underneath that to, uh, sh to provide additional support for that. Not only did they have to dig in, dig that, but before they did it, they had to, around the whole area, construct a freeze wall. So they had to drill holes to 40-some feet deep and circulate refrigerant in that so that their tunnels wouldn't flood. The, the tunnels, there were two shafts dug, about 14 and by 26 feet went down, and then to connect the tunnels, there were, those two access shafts, there was a uh, tunnel 275 feet long to get into that. In other words, this was a major project. Uh, initial uh, estimates, it cost over 200 million, and probably because it went on much longer than it had been projected to be, the cost is probably double that. Uh, by the, you know, instead of the 330 million, it was probably a lot more than that. So this was a, a major problem that occurred. The bill keeps getting bigger and yeah, the bigger. bill keeps getting bigger. We're going to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll find out what factors and events outside of Midland 
affected the construction of the Midland Nuclear Power Plant. So we'll be right back. Midland Community Television has exciting news for Midland area nonprofits. Recently, MCTV has undergone changes both technologically and organizationally to help you share your story better and reach your audience wherever they are. Our new services include public service announcements, special event recordings, audio podcasts, YouTube video, live TV broadcasts streamed online, and more. Call 837-3474 for details. Follow us on Facebook and search for MCTV Community Voices on YouTube or podcast platforms for more local stories. Join us to build a better community through media at MCTV. If you've just joined us, you're watching Backyard Reactors. My name is Ron Beacom. My guest is Lee Smith the author of a book about the failed nuclear power plant project here in Midland. So Lee, let's get right back into the slides. Okay, when we left off, we were talking basically about uh, problems that occurred on the site of this uh, construction, and now we're gonna shift to some things that happened that really influenced the, the future uh, that happened other places. Uh, the term China syndrome has been around for quite a while and it's a sequence of events that uh, would follow a meltdown of a nuclear reactor where the core eats through its containment building goes deep into the earth. Uh, it is a very uh, largely improbable event but, but a possible event. So one might say, okay, if we had a movie called the China syndrome, it would probably be made by a a class B studio with actors you'd never heard of. Well, in 1979, there was a movie made, The China Syndrome, released in March of 79, and it was not any of the things I just said. It was distributed by Columbia Pictures, a major uh, producer, and it starred Jack Lemmon, Jane Fonda, and Michael Douglas. Jack Lemmon uh, had previously won Best Supporting Actor for Mr. Ro uh, his role in Mr. Roberts and been nominated three times for Academy Award. Uh, Jane Fonda uh, had previously won two Academy Awards and nominated for others and Michael Douglas was just beginning his career. So this was not a uh, movie that was just uh, put together by nobody with nobody in it. Uh, the plot of the film basically is that Jane Fonda plays a uh, TV uh, news reporter who's doing a feature on energy in California and she and her uh, cameraman played by Michael Douglas visit a uh, fictitious uh, plant in California and are taking a tour and no sooner did they get into the uh, observation uh, deck that looks over the control room when it's obvious that a terrible problem is going on. Uh, Jack Lemmon is, plays in the movie the uh, shift supervisor and through a miraculous set of uh, uh, actions taken by him they do bring the problem uh, that, that seemed to be that the reactor was going to overheat. They bring that problem uh, under control and things go on. Uh, in the movie shortly thereafter Jane, the Jane the character played by Jane Fonda uh, interviews a physicist who said that uh, if uh, they had not been able to control the event, it would have radiated uh, an area the size of Pennsylvania. This movie played to uh, sell out crowds immediately upon opening. It was the biggest uh, non-holiday movie uh, ever that Columbia had had. Well, less than two weeks after this movie was released at a real uh, nuclear plant called Three Mile Island, an event happened. At 4 a.m. in the morning, an alarm sounded in their control room, and the reactors uh, had a problem. Uh, the uh, people on duty did not function the way the ones did in the movie. They did not get the event under control, and by 6.57, they were at a site emergency. At 7.10, Captain Dave, a traffic reporter for a local radio station, hears on his citizen band radio that the police and firefighters are being mobilized in Middletown, three miles from the Three Mile Island plant. In other words, 
an orderly uh, announcement going out to the public did not happen at Three Mile Island. Uh, on site at Three Mile Island at 7.36, they declared a general emergency. Uh, Captain Dave called his news director at the station, who tried to contact the utility in charge of Three Mile Island, and he was told that uh, the general emergency was a red tape kind of thing required by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Of course, this was not true, and uh, the night of March 28, Walter Cronkite began his CBS Evening News with a report on Three Mile Island saying it was the first step in a nuclear nightmare. He, can, he uh, talked a little bit about it. And, and if we go back to 1979, we have to remember that uh, everybody wasn't snuggied up in their own little news cocoon in 1979. Walter Cronkite was a widely respected and believed uh, reporter, so if he said something, the whole nation tended to believe what he said. Uh, the beginning of this uh, events at Three Mile Island continued for about a week with a lot of misinformation, a lot of confusion uh, going on. Uh, as a result, there were a whole series of investigative committees formed. Uh, in the end, there was no lasting damage, health damage from Three Mile Island, but it was from start to finish a public relations disaster for nuclear energy in this country. Uh, Mary Sinclair said of the Three Mile Island, uh, you know, it's terrible that people weren't told about it and, and have the ability to leave immediately. Uh, Consumers Power tried to put a spin on it, saying, well, it really doesn't uh, matter that much, it's a relatively new thing and people don't understand it. The bad thing for consumers' power was that in they had already installed in the Midland plant the very same equipment that Three Mile Island had, so that when the investigations came along, there were many, many changes mandated for Midland. Uh, and one other thing that happened was it changed public opinion uh, all over. Uh, Mary Sinclair in 1978 had made a talk over at the Guadalupe Center in Bay City and in that audience had been uh, six friends who had, a couple of which had been active in Vietnam protests and they decided what the Midland needed was some real live protests. This has not been Mary Sinclair's style but they organized their first protest for July 4th, 1978. They held another one in the fall. And uh, a young Michael Moore and his Hurance Alliance got wind of this. And so they joined together uh, with this group, which was the Lone Tree, called themselves the Lone Tree Council, and for a <coughs> protest march in April of 79. They had planned this before Three Mile Island, and they thought that they'd probably get about three or four hundred people. Well, as Three Mile Island happened, and in 1979, 4,000 people showed up in Midland. This is them getting organized at Emerson Park. They marched down Main Street, across the bridge, to, to Emerson Overlook Park. Here's a group of the protesters doing chanting, uh, call and response with Michael Moore, who's up uh, leading the crowd on. Balloons were released with little notes in them, helium balloons that said if, you, if this was, uh, if there was a release, you would be radiated by now. So there was, uh, appeared to be in 79, maybe even in Midland, some anti-nuke uh, feelings. However, uh, in 1980, uh, for the state representative uh, race, uh, guy by the name of Michael D. Hayes, who was a young uh, county clerk, uh, announced that he was going to run for the House seat. Uh, Mary Sinclair also announced that she was going to run. Uh, she, both of them ran spirited campaigns. Mary tried to uh, broaden her list of issues, but she said at the time she wanted to know if the hostility towards her that had existed back in the late 60s still existed. Well, uh, Mike Hayes won by 60% of the vote, so it appeared that
probably Midland still did want their plant in 1980, but when I interviewed Mike Hayes, he said when he went to Lansing after he was elected, it was, a, it was obvious in Lansing that there just wasn't political support for nuclear energy in general and specifically for the Midland plant. Uh, by February 1981, the cost to complete the Midland plant had risen to $3.1 billion. Uh, and uh, so they were 11 times over budget, and they were now saying they'd have steam service to Dow in 1984. If you remember, originally that was supposed to be 1974. Uh, because of inflation in general and uh, uh, regard for consumers power also, uh, consumers power was having to uh, do financing at 10 to 12 percent a year. Uh, also bumping the cost up is, uh, as you'll remember, we said that in the beginning there were supposed to be about 500 or 700 people employed on the Midland site. By 76 it was 1,400. By 1978 it was 3,000. By 79 it was 3,600. And by 1983 they had 5,500 workers working at the Midland site. They had so many workers that they ran a bus service to transport people to and from the remote parking lots. I can just add a comment. Growing up in Coleman, uh, people that I went to high school with when we got out of high school were landing jobs right away that paid pretty well as a laborer for Bechtel or, or yeah. office work. So it was a good employment. Yes. Uh, and, you know, just to kind of look at this, the billions, you can see we start out at 267 million or 0.267 billion. Uh, by this time, you know, we were up to over 3 billion and climbing. Uh, Finally, Dow had enough in 1983, and they canceled their contract uh, at that. Of course, Dow sued consumers, and consumers sued Dow, but Dow said in 1983 the cost of getting steam from the Midland plant was intolerable. In 1983, consumers tried to recover the cost of their plant by raising the rates that their customers would pay to 27.7%. Uh, this, of course, uh, was not well received, and one of the people leading the, the, the uh, opposition to this was Frank Kelly. Frank Kelly was Attorney General of Michigan. He was first uh, uh, appointed in 1961. He went on to win election 10 times after that. Some people called him, instead of the Attorney General, the Eternal General. Uh, he was a force to be reckoned with in Michigan. Uh, he was very successful in uh, some early consumer complaint things and was part of the tobacco settlement. Uh, a lot of people liked him, obviously, the number of times he got elected. Another, uh, another group of people didn't think so much of him. They really likened him to the vindictive driver who, in a dark night on a two-lane blacktop road in northern Michigan. He, this vindictive driver sees the uh, car ahead of him run over a small animal and the animal is writhing on the shoulder and the vindictive driver swerves and runs over the animal again. In 1983, uh, consumers was that writhing animal. They had a big problem with what they were going to do with all the money they'd spent on the Midland plant and no way to try to recover it. Uh, there was a series of negotiations that went on uh, to try to bail them out, but on July 17, 1984, uh, the Board of Consumers Power canceled the Midland plant. They had run out of money, basically. Uh, they tried to borrow $500 million in Wall Street and been turned down, so they really had no, no uh, option other than to cancel it. Uh, when it was canceled, uh, it was a big deal for Midland, obviously, but Cal Yider, who was uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce at that time, talked about, he thought that it, General Motors and outstate Michigan and the governor let Midland down, but he said Midland will survive and go forward. And as a matter of fact, that's what happened. Uh, this is a letter that I was uh, able to get a hold of that, sh that 
Paul Orifice wrote uh, that Bill McCormick, the new president of Consumers, uh, Consumers had gotten rid of all their top management, wrote to Paul Orvis in 1986. It was a general letter that talked about the plans that McCormick had come up with to use some of the assets from the new plant to build a gas-fired plant. And at the bottom of it, he just scrawled a note and said, do you need any steam? Well. Uh, this letter got passed down the chain at uh, the Dow Chemical Company, and this man, Pete Lehman, was given the job of trying to, trying to see if this would work. And he was able, with his team of people, to uh, come up with a deal with Consumers Power, and basically the deal was this. On the site, they would install 12 very large natural gas-fired turbines. They take the waste heat from those turbines uh, to use one of the steam turbines left over from the nuke design, and they'd also be able to supply Dow with steam. The capabilities of this design were basically the same as those that had, as far as electrical generation and steam supply, as the original uh, nuke design would have offered. And so uh, the name of the entity that was created because consumers couldn't uh, put any more money into uh, the site uh, was called the Midland Cogeneration Venture Partnership. Uh, that yellow circle here shows the location of the gas turbines on the site. Uh, Here's what it looks like from across the cooling pond. On the right, of course, are the containment vessels and the, the nuke plant. And on the left is the new uh, natural gas-fired cogeneration plant. Today, the Midland Cogeneration Limited Partnership, it's paid local taxes of $450 million through 2017. I was just told in 2018 they paid a, another $30 million in state and local taxes. They provide a bunch of employment in Midland. They sell 1,240 megawatts to Consumers Energy Company. They sell electricity to the Dow Chemical Company and steam, and they also sell steam to the Dow Corning Corporation. So at the end of the day, this story has a somewhat happy ending. Uh, the Midland Cogeneration Venture was able to make useful about a quarter of the original investment that was poured into the site in Midland. So I guess you can't say the glass is half half full, but it certainly is a quarter of full, and there was a large possibility that what, what could have existed on that site is nothing today. Briefly, what, from your perspective, what couple lessons did have been learned? Well, there's a whole bunch of lessons here. One is, uh, Construction management, uh, that needs to be looked at very carefully in a project like this. Uh, another is that the regulatory uh, framework needs to be carefully examined. Uh, Bill Gates right now is trying to uh, advance a new uh, design of reactors. And I can't help but think when I look at the press releases for this new program that they are going to be faced with some of the same challenges that this, this plant was historically faced with. Construction management, regulatory oversight, uh, and the uh, j thing that sits in the background of this is we still haven't solved what to do with high level uh, radioactive waste from nuclear plants. Ironically, had the Midland plant been successful, there would now be hundred tons of high-level nuclear waste stored on the site, on the floodplain of the Titabawasi River, because that's what we have all over the country. We have, have a bunch of sites on the Great Lakes where you have high-level nuclear waste that's stored on those sites because there's no place, there's that's, no repository for there's it. There's current policy, yeah. yeah. Uh, then, Lee, please share again briefly. In your research, who have you come across or what have you come across that's helped you 
get you more information or just an interesting story that you've come well, across? Well, I certainly would, I call this the project because I started out to do a very limited look at one little aspect of this and there have been so many people that have helped me. The Midland Daily News has let me go in the attic of their old uh, facility they had. People have gotten stuff out of their basements, out of their attics. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to name people because I'm sure I'd forget somebody. Sure. But it, it, but, and I would like to finally make a plug. I'm not quite done. And if anybody has any stories, any information, on this whole saga, I sure would like to hear them, and my email address, of course, has is... been by your name. It, and we're recording this the end of January 2019. Where, where are you at in your book project? Uh, I have a manuscript, <laughs> and it is my sincere hope to send it off to a publisher uh, in February. Uh, that's a... I, I really... Uh, perplexed about who might want to publish this uh, and so I don't know what happens from here. Uh, I only hope live, I live long enough to do something with it. Well I appreciate you taking the time to do the research, the presentations, a couple you already made in Midland, what you've yeah. done here today and this might trigger more presentations around town because it's a significant part of Midland's history and the We'll say the second half of the 20th century is a big deal. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about my project. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, Lee, thanks for appearing okay. on our program. We encourage our viewers to keep an eye on the media, uh, information about the book. You've been watching Backyard Reactors, a program about the failed nuclear power plant project in Midland that has a somewhat happy ending with MCV. Uh, my guest has been Lee Smith. My name is Ron Beacom. Thanks for watching.